Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Sam Jones. I'm a research fellow with UNU WIDA, based here in Maputo. Thank you very much for joining us for this parallel session on Southern Africa during the pandemic. We have uh, four presentations and five speakers uh, from Mozambique and South Africa, looking at a number of different aspects of, of the pandemic. What we have is uh, a bit like the previous um, uh, sessions, the Q&A function is there to, for your questions. So please do make sure you click on, on the right hand of your screen, hopefully, session Q&A. So make sure you're within the session, then Q&A, and feel free to place your questions there. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, five presenters. We have uh, two uh, colleagues from Southern Africa, well, from South Africa, uh, well, speaking about Southern Africa, uh, Harun Borat and Kutsai Mataba. And we have uh, three from Mozambique, Ivan Manik, Rosario Beto, and Fenorio Castigo. I will present you uh, individually just prior to the presentations. The presentations are recorded uh, just to avoid any technical glitches, so we'll see how that goes. So, with the interests of time, let's move to the first presentation, which are two short presentations uh, together. Uh, they are by starting with Rosario Beto and then followed by Fenorio Castigo. They are uh, two Mozambican researchers based at the, uh, uh, the Ministry of Economy and Finance, uh, respectively looking at macroeconomic issues and on the microeconomic and poverty issues. So, Elena, would you please uh, press the play button on the, uh, on the first two presentations? Thank you so much. Hello to everyone. I am Rosario Beto from Mozambique. I will present now the study about the macroeconomic impact of COVID-19 in Mozambique. This study uh, was made by Marcia Chelengo, Sam Jones, uh, Michael Keller, Ibrahim Musaji, Tig Seventa, Fintarp, and me. Uh, our first case of COVID-19 in Mozambique uh, was registered on 22 of March of 2020. But it's important to note that the effects or the impact of this pandemic uh, began before be, became the, the, before the virus arrives itself in Mozambique. But uh, our, after our first case, we can see on the graph that the numbers, uh, the, the daily cases uh, were increased during the year, even the accumulated cases were increased until we registered our peak in the end of the year. Due to this, uh, the government of Mozambique uh, uh, makes uh, efforts to contain the spread of the pandemic. The pandemic. Uh, however, uh, measures to mitigate the effects of the pandemic, uh, this stat uh, aims to assess the economic costs of imported and domestic shocks of COVID-19. We can see it on external and internal shocks. And uh, the state of emergency implemented by the government of Mozambique. For this, we can assume uh, or identify four channels through which the state of emergency have negatively affected individual economic sectors. Uh, the first uh, channel uh, has assumption is called some supply shocks at industry level, a uh, second uh, demand shock, third the investment shock, and finally the fourth is export shocks. The approach used uh, to this study is called social accounting matrix multiply model. Um, this, uh, this model uh, or framework, uh, it's a matrix uh, that maps out the income and expenditure accounts uh, of industries, industries and single uh, accounts for enterprises, households, government, saving investment, and the rest of the world. So uh, we consider uh, around 51 activities and around 52 commodities 
uh, we, uh, that we call products. Uh, we assumed two scenarios. Uh, the first scenario pre prevents households from spending their money, and the uh, second scenario uh, scenario uh, forces the closure of non-essential industry. So, in this scenario, we assume that the closure of activity is a contraction of goods and service demands uh, that the industry produce. In consequence of that, there is a drop on production. Uh, so, in the first uh, scenario. Uh, we assume an impact on household demand. Looking for our results, we can see that uh, our first case was in, in the end of March uh, and period, uh, uh, or, or the first quarter, uh, it, it was a period without uh, uh, COVID-19 in Mozambique. So we can uh, uh, evaluate uh, uh, the impact of, uh, uh, of uh, COVID-19 uh, after the, the, first, the first quarter. So we, we, will, uh, we will see the impact on second, third, and the last quarter of 2020. So first of all, we will look at the, the impact on GDP. Uh, we can see uh, from uh, domestic and foreign uh, channel that the highest or the biggest impact uh, of pandemic on GDP were on foreign uh, channel uh, in the second, the third, even in the in the last quarter of 2020. But in the end of the year, we can see that Mozambique lost uh, around T. 3.6% of GDP. Have a look uh, to the expenditure component on GDP, uh, looking for the identity formula to GDP, uh, calculated by consumption, investments, exports, and imports. We can see that uh, exports uh, were the, the, the channel that the, the pandemic uh, presented a biggest uh, a big a big impact. Uh, this is followed by the investments. I have a look into the production uh, by industry. Uh, the impact uh, of pandemic on GDP uh, were high, uh, were high, was higher in the mining and the trade sectors. Uh, and the, 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 when we make some comparison of domestic and foreign uh, channel, the foreign sh channel shows a biggest uh, impact than uh, the domestic channel. Uh, moving to other component uh, to employment, we, 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 we saw the impact on GDP. Now we will look uh, the impact of the pandemic on employment. Uh, what stands out is the greater uh, impact on commerce uh, and accommodation. Uh, it is due to direct higher impact on employment output and high elasticity, elasticity employment output for activities of service in general. Uh, we can see this impact on employment uh, in commerce and accommodation. Even in the GDP, we can see the, the, the accommodation, its uh, impact is also higher. Uh, we can make a summary of this in, the, those in, impacts on GDP and uh, employment. We can see on the left, uh, some uh, we have uh, around 25 um, activities, uh, but the, the, the first and the second is accommodation and uh, food services and wholesale and retail trade. Uh, even in GDP, even in employment, we can see that these activities were uh, had a biggest impact on uh, uh, of COVID-19. Uh, moving to income of households, uh, looking for the low and uh, the lowest and the highest uh, incomes, uh, making some comparison uh, in these groups, uh, in those groups, uh, we can't see significant uh, difference, but we can note that the lowest incomes is equivalent to around 8% of our population uh, and uh, uh, the 20 percent uh, corresponds to population with higher incomes. To conclude, uh, it can be seen that the most impact on the economy uh, results from the exporter channel. It's a foreign channel. Therefore, 
has an external origin. Uh, direct effects are seen through the economy. Uh, to conclude, we can say that uh, Mozambique lost uh, around the 3.6 percent of GDP because of the pandemic. But when we look uh, for the real GDP published by the National Institute of Statics, uh, Statistics in Mozambique, uh, it was um, around one point, uh, we, we Mozambique resisted a, a contraction of 1.3% uh, of GDP. But if we sum this real GDP and the GDP that Mozambique lost, uh, Mozambique would have grown around 2.3%. Uh, uh, if Mozambique uh, had no uh, um, the, the, the COVID-19. Some recommendation we can uh, make to our country is to diversify exports, investing in infrastructure, in infrastructures such as roads, bridge, investing more in developing uh, the potential of the domestic market, Sorry, improving the business environment and value chain. And finally, the government of Mozambique must adopt an inclusive and robust industrialization policy focused on manufacturing. So thank you for your attention. Uh, my name is Finor Castigo. I'm from Mozambique. I work in the Ministry of Economy and Finance. Uh, I will address um, uh, COVID micro impact and uh, four other authors uh, was involved in, in this study. Uh, this study helped the impact of COVID-19 and the measure implemented uh, by the government of Mozambique on poverty and, and consumption. Uh, the methodology is based on the macroeconomic impact estimated by Beto at all uh, using uh, the household budget survey year 14. Uh, the data uh, is about uh, 11,000 households interviewed three times over uh, 12 months, and the data is representative at the national, urban, uh, rural, and provincial level. Uh, our assumption. Uh, that loss in income and wage and employment, uh, the main result consumption decreased between uh, 7.1 and 14.4 uh, percentage, and poverty increase uh, between uh, 4.3 and 9.9 uh, percentage point in 2019 uh, and 2020. Uh, we use three. An analytical approach uh, that combines uh, these different channels. Uh, each approach using headed lab information by sector, by education, and rural urban residents, or by income quintile and rural urban residents to assessing who is affected. Uh, then we apply uh, the conception income or consumption wise elasticity to estimate conception and poverty. Uh, impact. Uh, in this picture, we present results in terms of percentage reduction in conception and percentage point increase from the initial poverty rates at different levels. For the increase in the poverty rate, we also include the result corresponding to absolute number of people falling into poverty as estimated uh, using, using the population projection for 20. Uh, 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 our conclusion, COVID-19 has pro produced a setback for poverty reduction in Mozambique. Uh, many more households uh, fell in poverty or try a drop in consumption. Uh, the long-term structural drives of poverty seem to be still at work. Uh, we know that the uh, new drives likely emerged. Uh, our recommendation uh, essential to support a household in rural areas. Uh, it's a necessary implementation of bulk save 
uh, net for vulnerable group at the risk of experiencing huge drops in consumption due to unexpected shocks such as COVID. Uh, is especially important for people working in the informal sector in the urban areas or working in the personal service uh, sector. And uh, thank you. Great, thank you. That was our first presentation looking at uh, essentially simulating some of the impacts of uh, COVID-19 in Mozambique, taking both a macroeconomic and a microeconomic uh, perspective. I should note that these papers are available uh, on the IGM, the Inclusive Growth in Mozambique uh, website, as well as the UNU wider website. If you want to take a closer look, we can share the link. Um, now, moving on to our next presentation, very pleased to have with us Harun Borat, who probably doesn't need to be introduced, but just in case. Um, he's a professor uh, of economics at UCT in Cape Town, uh, director of the Development Policy Research Unit, also a, a member of the uh, Board of Economic Advisors uh, to the South African Presidency, and an esteemed member of our UNU wider board. Um, great to have you with us, Harun. Uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, Elena, please press play. Good morning, everybody. Um, so the attempt in this sort of uh, whistle-stop tour in terms of understanding the economic impact of uh, COVID-19 in South Africa is really uh, three-part. I'm going to try and give you an overview of the GDP employment and some of the early evidence on uh, inequality effects, and then look secondly um, at the what I call the Ramaphosa package as a stimulus package in response to COVID-19 and specifically focus on social assistance. And then very, very briefly talk about some of the emerging debt dynamics on the macro side for, for South Africa. So really, as is well known, um, this data we most of us sort of live with in the last year suggests um, uh, peaks and troughs. So we currently as South Africa in the midst of the third wave, let me just find my laser pointer. So you can see us here in the red. We are currently in the third wave. In absolute terms, in terms of infections, we're still below the sort of uh, UK, um, uh, India, US type figures, but certainly following a very similar pattern to other emerging markets. We had an early sort of strong lockdown uh, in terms of the pandemic, and what that did was to buy us time for the in inevitable growth in infections. So we followed paths that are very similar to other developing countries, and uh, I would suspect similar to some of the emerging markets uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we've switched now towards, as, as is most of the developing world, towards procuring uh, vaccines, and a vaccination program has been rolled out with a lot of support and collaboration with the private sector. So that's the next phase. What the damage, uh, the damage that was done by the pandemic is clear. I've got here one graphic, there's so many of these, but this is sort of the 2020 effect, if you like, uh, in terms of GDP growth rates, South Africa's in the blue bar. So we saw a contraction of about 7% um, over the period that's compared to a sample of middle income countries. And we're pretty much in the middle of that sample, slightly above the average. You could take the simple average for that uh, sample. Um, but in essence, there's a strong prediction of a bounce back between 2 and 5% for, for next year. And we'll wait and see whether that's playing out. Some of the numbers are encouraging in terms of growth, and I'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, I think what's important is to look at the heterogeneous effect across developing countries. And uh, certainly in Southern Africa, our one neighbor, Botswana, has seen a much larger contraction. It'll be interesting to hear what other colleagues say um, in terms of the Southern Africa effect. Now, in terms of employment, I think one of the things that, uh, that was clear is that we had um, uh, non-linear effects in terms of employment uh, outcomes over the quarters. So what I've done here is take 2019, Right, so that's employment across the four quarters for 2019 in the solid line, and then the distribution of employment across the four quarters for 2020. What's very clear is we had this massive contraction of about 2.2 million jobs using the official quarterly labor force survey statistics. Um, but then there's, there's some pullback, if you like, into the third and fourth quarters. So in, in effect, if you look at us across the quarterly figures for 2020, 
what we see is a net job loss of about 1.4 million. Just uh, as a comparator, during the Great Recession, uh, South Africa recorded about 900,000 jobs lost. Now notice in terms of the GDP contraction of 7%, this is a decrease of about 8%. So a slightly more elastic response on the employment side relative to GDP. Uh, just to keep in mind, this is, the, this is the trend, of course, that we want to be looking at. Certainly some of the figures for, unfortunately, for the first quarter of uh, 2021 are not encouraging in terms of the, of the growth in employment. Um, now, one of the interesting things, at least for us as labor economists, is that we focus on the extensive margin. So we really are looking at um, um, changes in employment. Uh, if you look at the Great Recession and the numbers there and the work that was done there. But one of the things that we, we don't usually look at, at least in South Africa, is what happened at the intensive margin, just because the movement isn't great. And you can see the solid line for 2019, no real change in the share. So this is the percentage of workers reporting zero hours of work. That doesn't really change in 2019, but look at the massive spike in the second quarter of um, uh, 2020. What this suggests is of course a massive, so about 15% of workers report still being employed, but working zero hours. Effectively, employers have sent them home and either continue to pay their wages or, and that's the income loss side, have actually reduced their wages. And I think that's a really important aspect of the pandemic in terms of the negative income shocks, even though it may have been transitory, uh, because as we move into the fourth quarter, this has uh, uh, stabilized. So what about that wage reduction? So if we look at wages across the percentile, there's a little bit of good news in that most of the wage reduction we saw in South Africa um, was for 90th and 75th percentile workers. So the larger reductions were there. And as we go down the wage distribution post pandemic, right? So that's post the dotted line, if you like, in the pandemic period, sorry. Uh, we see smaller reductions for workers at, bottom, at, at lower percentiles. So you've got negative income shocks, yes, but it seems to be in percentage terms, larger for, um, um, for high income uh, workers uh, or workers further up the wage distribution. The difficulty though, right? So, and this is the story that's emerging is that you've got wage, uh, so you've got, in, you've got employment losses, right? Um, north of 700,000. Uh, and that seems to be mainly for, for um, low income households. So if we look at the employment contraction, right? So the employment relative to the first quarter of 2021, sorry, first quarter of 2020, the biggest reduction is for individuals coming from households in the poorest 20% of the distribution, right? And you see that that trend continues right through the quarters and the least effect affected are those in the richest 20% of the household distribution in terms of employment. So the two-part effect is yes, wage reduction seems to be large in percentage terms for higher earning workers, but certainly the biggest job loss is for uh, individuals from poorer households. The Gini coefficient, of course, has those two things happening, right? So on the one hand, just mechanically, you've got this reduction in wages at the top end, but also these, this massive fallout of job losses. So in other words, the zero earners, right? Um, uh, uh, grow, if you like, um, in terms of, um, uh, uh, in terms of the job losses that you see. We're only measuring here the wage genie, right? And so what we see with the wage genie is this sharp increase initially, and then uh, a clawback slightly by the fourth quarter. I think it's a more interesting question to see what's happened to uh, overall inequality. So now moving to the sectoral profile of uh, employment losses, and I'm aware of running out of time, there's sort of a couple of big results. A disproportionate share of the job losses were actually in the secondary sector. So if you look at the last column, 30% of all job losses emanated from the secondary sector, whereas they only constitute about 19% of all jobs. So effectively, the, in the main, you've got job losses mainly in the secondary sector. And if you run through this for semi-skilled and unskilled workers. However, specifically interesting, um, is this block on formality, what we call formality, but essentially what it suggests is that, and I should note that this is for a slightly different period, second quarter 2020 versus second quarter 2019. So that's why my job losses are slightly higher. This was at the peak. The majority of job losses or 50% of job losses actually came from workers in the informal sector and uh, private households, in other words, domestic services. And for formal sector workers, the overwhelming majority of these workers were private, non-unionized workers. Right. And so effectively, that's the 
prototype of the typical worker that lost um, their job, right? They tended to be either male or female. So there wasn't an overwhelming share of gender differentiation, at least on these results. They may change if we look at different time periods. The majority were African workers, but tended to be in the informal sector, in domestic work, uh, and, and probably non-unionized. The response from President Ramaphosa was swift. Um, the, just to show on the right hand side, in, in comparative terms, this was a significant stimulus package, probably one of the highest in the developing world, uh, certainly one of the highest in the emerging market and middle income country sample. Uh, I want to concentrate very quickly on social assistance, the 50 billion package. Um, you see here this massive spike in grants, right? The number of grant recipients after um, the March 2020 uh, outbreak of the pandemic and the lockdown starts, but it's very clear the majority of this was due to the new grant. So South Africa has introduced a new grant called the COVID-19 Social Relief of Distress Grant. Think of it as a grant that's supposed to cover individuals who are unemployed or in the informal sector. What happens is through these new grants and the top-ups that the president offered or cabinet offered or government offered, you reach 41% of the population. So there's this massive increase from about 30 of about 10% of the population now coming on stream through this new grant. It's far more evenly distributed across uh, the um, deciles of the distribution. If you look at grants, these are um, based on our own backend calculations, not actual administrative data. We would suggest looking at our absolute figures that if you, if you reach into the seventh decile of the distribution, you are reaching a large number of workers that lost their jobs either because they were in the informal sector or domestic services. So the COVID grant, uh, at least the early evidence suggests did its job. The problem is with this massive stimulus package and growth contraction is pre-COVID-19, pre we faced a deficit of GDP ratio of 7%. This spiked to 16% in the supplementary budget um, during in the midst of COVID-19, but this has dramatically fallen to 9.3%, principally because of this resource revenue windfall. So we have this uh, breathing space offered to us by the commodity super cycle um, that seems to be occurring. The figure to keep in mind, and that's what this, this data tries to do, is to show if we hit revenue shortfalls of, say, 30%, right, based on um, uh, a 6% GDP, you've got a, a deficit of GDP ratio that's going to go up to about 17%. So effectively, the number to keep in mind is both growth rates and the consequent revenue generation from that. So in conclusion, you've had a massive shock, 7% of GDP and, and um, at the margin, a larger employment shock. And, and the stimulus package was designed to at least uh, shore up some of those massive income losses initially. Um, and I think one of the things that, um, that's really, really important with respect to how we think about um, the uh, combination of policy packages for South Africa going forward is uh, how one manages that through in terms of the rising debt to GDP ratios. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much for that uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, maybe just one thing that highlights to me there is the, you know, the importance of having these good quality rich data uh, that was available in South Africa to be able to track some of these um, events in quasi real time. Uh, time is running, so um, I'm very pleased to uh, um, <clears throat> welcome our third presenter, uh, Kudzai Mataba. Um, she is a legal scholar with an advanced degree in international trade and investment law, uh, has worked with uh, TIPS in Pretoria, and now I believe is with the International Trade Center in Geneva. So now we're shifting the focus a little bit to trade and some of the legal challenges, uh, well, the regional challenges involved in continuing trade during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Alina. Please press, press play. The title of this working paper is COVID-19 and Trade Facilitation in Southern Africa, Implications for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. This paper looked at the importance of trade facilitation in Africa, and then went on to give a broad overview of the impact of COVID-19 on trade in the region, it looked at the regional trade facilitation responses taken by the RICS at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, and then went on to forward some policy considerations towards the African Continental Free Trade Agreement 
learning from the key findings of the case studies taken within the Southern African region. Trade facilitation refers to the broad range of measures that serve to streamline and simplify the technical and legal procedures in the trade of goods. The aim of trade facilitation is to lower the overall cost of trade by significantly decreasing the amount of time it takes for goods to travel from one country to the next. Transportation costs in Africa remain extremely high. It is approximated that 63% that they are at least 63% higher than those experienced in developed economies and at least 135% higher than those in Europe. A practical example of this would be that a 3000 kilometer journey from Kolowezi in the DRC near the southern border with Zambia to Durban on the North South Corridor could take up to 38 days during the peak period of which plus or minus 29 days will be spent at borders due to delays. This effectively means that this 3000 kilometer rail journey will be taken at a speed of four kilometers per hour, which is clearly unsustainable. Customs transactions through major corridors on average take 20 to 30 different parties, 40 documents and 200 data elements within the context of a highly paper-based system, which further increases the cost of trade. This situation is juxtaposed against many African countries high re reliance on revenues from tax related, from trade related taxes in order to sustain their day to day governmental functionality. What the COVID-19 pandemic did was confirm what we already knew about trade in Africa. For example, that intra African exports are more resilient than Africa's exports to the world. In May 2020, we saw a peak decline of 40 minus 44% in intra African exports, but intra African exports were on the rebound at least by August. In comparison, Africa's exports to the rest of the world only began to, see, to show some improvements after September 2020. What this highlights is the importance of further developing competitive and diversified intra-African value chains in the future, but these must be supported by a strong trade facilitation regime. It is further important to note that the COVID-19 pandemic is far from over. And this graph shows that in the past 10 days, at least 50% of ships leaving the eastern coast of China were experiencing delays, either as a result of virus outbreaks, which, which led to the closure of ports and congestion, or extreme weather conditions, and particularly typhoons. This is a phenomenon that has been experienced in other developed economies, such as in Germany, and has significantly slowed down global supply chains and to this Africa will not be immune. Therefore, it is important for us to continue learning and building from the lessons we learned at the peak of the pandemic last year. On the left side of my screen, you will see a map detailing the major ports and corridors in Southern Africa, bringing particular attention to the corridor reflected in red, the North-South Corridor, which runs from Durban in South Africa, all the way to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. This trade corridor transverses at least three regional economic groups, beginning in Saku, Sadek, moving into Komesa, and then finally into the East African community. On the right side of my screen, you will see a collation of the major trade facilitation response mechanisms taken by the RICS within Southern Africa, mainly, during the peak of the pandemic last year. And what one learns from this is that there was general agreement on the facilitation of essential supplies. However, Rex took different approaches to things such as air transport, cross-border transport operations, as well as transit deliveries. This posed a particular problem for transporters trying to transverse corridors such as the North-South Corridor, which run through a multiplicity of economic groupings. The main lessons we took were firstly from the experience of the Citrus Growers Association, representing citrus growers in Zimbabwe, Eswatini, and South Africa. Last year, the pandemic saw a boom in supply for Southern African citrus due to a decline in the Spanish season, due to a lack of seasonal workers to harvest the fruit, as well as a global increase in demand for health foods such as citrus. However, the Citrus Growers Association was not supported in its export ambitions. 
And what we saw was that where usually it will take them 228 hours to source and stamp all the necessary export required documents. This time was almost multiplied to 400 hours in some cases. A general lack of interdepartmental coordination meant that exporters would reach a port and not be able to find an official from the Department of Agriculture due to a lack of coordination and working times between the customs office and the Department of, of Agriculture office. And this was further compounded by port congestion, which further saw that in some cases, major shipping lines would completely bypass the Cape Town port due to delays, which at the peak were at about 14 days. This made shipping via Cape Town impractical. These experiences were further echoed on the North-South Corridor where we saw that there was firstly a lack of access to information due to the lack of involvement of national trade facilitation committees. Decisions and information were often made at very high level ministerial council meetings of ministers of trade and transport. And it sometimes took some time for this information to dis be disseminated down to the official at the border post, especially where there were changes in regulation. The Zambian border post was a particular program problem within SADAC, as the SADAC grouping had agreed to only screen drivers on arrival, in particularly those in transit, whereas the Zambian government took a mandate to make compulsory, to make it compulsory for truck drivers to have a negative COVID-19 test in order to enter its, its borders. This caused both the safety risk, as they were often insufficient or inadequate storage facilities for trucks carrying petroleum products, and also a health risk as drivers would spend two to three days at the border post with little to no ablution facilities within a health pandemic. What we saw amongst the successes were the pre-clearance arrangements agreed upon between Botswana, South Africa, Namibia, and Zimbabwe, as well as that the DRC and Zambia simulated a one-stop border post in order at various times during the pandemic in order to fast track the movement of traffic. The SADC Council of Ministers saw the importance of interregional cooperation and they began some dialogue with both COMESA and the EAC despite not reaching any hard, hard core rulings or decisions. This signaled a change in thinking, particularly within the region. There was also the establishment of an online platform which was used to share information on the production and trade of medical equipment. And this platform can be used in the future to share other trade related information. The AFCFTA builds on the progress of the WTO's trade facilitation agreement of which 37 or 54 African countries are already signatories. The AFCFTA by taking a top down approach to integration can provide the continent with a framework with which states can shape their own reform programs, highlighting issues deserving national attention through the ob obligation fulfillment matrix. The protocol further sets a framework enabling technical and financial cooperation between member states towards trade facilitation reform, remembering the high costs of both the reform in hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. The main policy proposals forwarded in this paper included the need to prioritize the formulation of robust trade facilitation committees. Although 20 are already reported on the continent and the region in particular, a major inquiry must be made into their functionality. As we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, well, the peak at least, these committees played a very minimal role towards the dissemination of information as well as decision-making. And this left decision-making at very high levels and sometimes inaccessible to the private sector. We need national trade facilitation committees that have a robust legal backing, are independent from the government of the day and are not placed in the back office of some trade related department. They must also be significantly financed in order for them to take on the difficult task of sometimes site visits. And lastly, they must take into consideration the interplay between the private and public sector involving the private sector who often have real time experiences of the situation of the ground. The case of the, of the Citrus Growers Association showed us the importance of fostering inter-border agency cooperation. This can be as simple as aligning working hours as well as streamlining procedures and processes so that a simple crate of fruit does not need 228 different 
export related documents in order to be shipped off. We also saw the importance of supporting and building one stop border posts. And although ATR already built or in the works on the continent, there's need for these to be for these to be developed into actual working one stop border posts and avoid situations as we've seen many times on the continent. For example, the Zambian and Zimbabwean Chirundi border post, where it is a one stop border post in name, but in practice, government officials on either side will duplicate the same pro processes and require the same documentation. The AFCFTA can build on the progress made during the pandemic through the championing of digitalization as an ally of trade facilitation, which is reflected in the thinking behind Article 17 of Annex 4. States already began to abandon paper-based systems as a result of the health risks of face-to-face -face contact. However, this should not be viewed as a temporary solution to the COVID-19, but should be taken further towards the digitalization of the trade regime in the region. Lastly, as was seen in the case of the Citrus Growers Association, it will be important for the region to invest in port infrastructure. This is because as global supply chains continue to shift and be threatened by health and weather risks such as typhoons, ports within the Southern African region must remain viable towards international shipping lines. And this can only be done if greater efficiencies are built towards the operation. I think I'll end my presentation there and I thank you for your time. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much. Very informative uh, presentation, highlighting the importance of understanding some of the legal uh, challenges and basic uh, non-tariff um, barriers to trade there. So uh, time is running out. So um, I'm very happy to uh, welcome our final presenter. Uh, Ivan Manik. Ivan has been working with us on the Inclusive Growth in Mozambique program um, as a trainee and consultant. Um, and well, he is going to present um, a paper co authored with me um, on a labor, a digital labor market platform and how that has provided some insights into COVID. Uh, Elena, please go ahead. Greetings from Mozambique. I am Ivan Manik, and I will be presenting a recent paper by Sam Johns and I, in which we investigate the impacts of COVID-19 on informal labor market using data from a digital matching platform in Mozambique. To start with some key points, it is known that COVID-19 have negatively impacted the economy. There is evidence that indicate that more vulnerable households were hardest hit by COVID-19. In Mozambique, for instance, estimates indicate that consumption poverty may have increased by 10 percentage points due to the pandemic. So this evidence indicate that the pandemic have affected especially the most vulnerable sides of the economy. In this paper, we also aim to analyze the impacts of COVID-19 on a vulnerable side of the economy. Here, we focus on how the crisis has affected supply and demand for informal manual freelancers in Mozambique, using data from Biscati labor market matching platforms. Platform, sorry. And we find that basically this admittedly niche market has been resilient and may well have supported adjustment to shock. So to give a context about COVID-19 and the labor market, it is important to recognize that COVID-19 is not just an economy-wide negative demand shock. It has complex effects on both demand and supply sides of the labor market. For instance, there is evidence that indicates uh, change, changes to composition of demand and the mode of delivery of products and goods due to the pandemic. And for instance, in Taiwan, there is uh, evidence that they indicate a shift to online food purchases as cases increase. In South Africa, for instance, also uh, in Kandua.com, which is a platform similar to Bishkat, was recorded a huge increase in the number of job requests comparing uh, March 2021 to April 2020. Also, 
going to the informal labor services, it is important to also acknowledge that this segment of the labor market provide many services, and these services are especially important in low-income urban settings. So in light of this context, in this paper, we aim to analyze how might COVID-19 affect these markets, both on supply and demand side. Basically, we postulate four different channels of impact. The first one is fear of infection. And here we expect that this channel impact, impacts negatively both supply and demand side of the formal labor market services. The second channel is formal business restrictions. And for both sides of the informal labor market, we expect an ambiguous sign. The third channel is reduced mobility. And for the supply side here, we expect an ambiguous sign and the demand side, we expect a positive impact. Lastly, we have the income loss. And for the supply side, relating, relatively to the income loss, we expect a positive impact because basically as people uh, loss uh, lose their incomes. Basically, the, the, the informal labor market may work as a source of extra income to compensate this loss. So for the demand side, we expect, again, here, an ambiguous impact. Overall, the net effect on this uh, demand and supply side is ultimately an empirical question. So this is how Biscata looks like in the online platform. Biscata is basically a free to use platform and covers around 18 uh, service categories. It is location specific and it is available online and also using USSD, which means that uh, one do not need a smartphone to use it. It has by now 50,000 workers and 30,000 unique uh, clients. So using data from this platform, we estimate, uh, we, we produce three outcomes of interest that stand for the supply and demand of the informal labor services. For the supply, we use the change in active registered workers. And for the demand, we use task contact rate and task agreement rate. Going to the empirical strategy, what we basically formulate is that our outcomes of interest are a function of each of the previously presented um, impact channels. We basically proxy the fear with the number of positive cases. We proxy the restriction with the stringency index from Oxford. We proxy the mobility with work mobility index from Google. And finally, we proxy the income with employment conditions index, which is retrieved from, retrieved from the National Institutes, National Statistics Institute. So we include also different controls and, and fixed effects. And we also had in this baseline model unit specific trends, specifically linear and quadratic trends. Furthermore, as an robustness, uh, robustness exercise, we remove unit specific pre -trends, pre trends. And basically, what we do is that we detrend our outcome variables. Uh, finally, we apply an even study uh, framework to analyze the net effects on our outcome variables. So going to the results, here we present the results in, for the baseline panel, uh, baseline model in this first panel, and for the priority training, which is our robustness, robust specification. And what we basically find is that the differences in the results between these two models are not uh, very uh, significant. Or basically, we will say that uh, our results are consistent. And we also don't find dramatic differences 
across different uh, trends. So our results are generally robust. So interpreting uh, only the baseline model, it is possible to see that uh, new cases that stand for the fear are negatively uh, associated with both the uh, are negatively associated with both supply and demand. We then find that stringency index is negatively associated with the with the supply. And finally, we find that the employment index or employment conditions are also negatively uh, related with the supply and demand. And what here these last results indicate is that has the employment conditions deteriorate, uh, people uh, run to the informal labor market as a coping, crisis coping mechanism. Here we present the results for the, for the event study analysis. In the X axis basically is our event window. And here zero basically presents the uh, event date, which is, which is where the shock occurs. Basically our shock is the COVID pandemic, the start of the pandemic in Mozambique. Oh, and basically what we find here is that right after the shock, there is a slight bump that is not uh, different from zero, statistically different from zero. And then we find a downward trend in the game and upward trend uh, in the number of workers. But these, uh, these dynamics are uh, not different from, from zero in many of the periods. In the, in the demand side, uh, using looking at the agreement rate, it is possible to see a significant bump in the agreement rate uh, that is then followed by uh, an upward trend, uh, showing that the impact of the COVID-19 COVID was significant and had different dynamics. So in which conclusion we get? So basically we conclude that consistent with the prior ambiguous impact of the pandemic, we find different set of responses operating, operating through multiple channels. We find that worsening general employment uh, outcomes appear to have pushed workers into Ishkat and stimulated demand for informal labor services. Overall, we find a zero net effect uh, previously I showed it, and, and on growth of registered workers, but a large increase in demand for uh, services. And basically because uh, informal services are cheaper or more flexible. So although we recognize that Bishkat platform is not representative of Mozambican labor market, even in urban areas, uh, these results have very important implications. And one of those is that digital matching platforms can help labor market, markets adjust to shocks, even in low income settings with low internet use. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Um, we are already over time. So uh, unfortunately there won't be a great deal of time for a, a Q and A. There are just uh, there's one question in the in the chat, but let me just perhaps just highlight a few takeaway points uh, from the presentation. So first of all, uh, a takeaway for me is the complexity of um, the COVID nineteen shock, um, as we saw uh, in terms of both trade, uh, in terms of the uh, in both both Mozambique and South Africa, different sectors were differentially affected with actually harsher effects, it seems to be, on some of the informal sector. Um, second highlight is the need to be able to act rapidly. Uh, in, most, in South Africa in particular, one could say that, that it has demonstrated the ability of the state at least to put forward grants and so on, that in other areas has to support the work of the poor. Uh, that's obviously come with some significant macroeconomic challenges looking forward. And thirdly, technology could be a role 
in Mozambique, we saw the SHCAT platform, which is not government, it's just a private sector platform, was able uh, to support some informal workers, find new activities, and adjust the pandemic. So I wanted just to end with two um, quick questions. The first is to Kudzai. There's a question here which says, to what extent do you foresee that trade patterns will change more permanently to the advantage of intra-African trade? And should this, is this a, is this a good sign? Thank you. I'll begin my, my submission by saying I think the, the, the any changes we should foresee or that we can hope for within the intra-African trade regime should be underpinned by greater industrialization. So as long as we're able to unlock the different value chains for critical supplies, such as in the textiles industry, also in the automotive sector, we would be hopeful towards such positive changes. However, as my presentation um, reflected on, there are significant risks, particularly towards the cost of trade. So as it is right now, it's, it remains far too expensive to move goods around. But once we get the economies of scale right and we create value chains that work for us, I think there are lots of uh, positive indicators that we're on the right track. Great, thank you so much. I think, I think um, yeah, there's some research to be done there on understanding what are the real costs of trade um, interregionally in sub-Saharan Africa to really highlight the importance of improved trade facilitation. Harun, if you wouldn't mind, I would like to ask you one question. What do you see perhaps looking forward in, in South Africa? Do you see that there could be universal based income or some kind of more permanent grants uh, to support the poor? Yeah, that's a good question, Sam. It's a very timeless one. I mean, at the moment, there's a massive push um, uh, nationally for what is called the basic income grant. I think on, on the one hand, there's that pressure. On the other hand, of course, one looks at the fiscus and the cost of uh, a universal grant, um, together with the notion that um, uh, in incentivizing firms, and here I mean survivalist firms, micro enterprises, has been underappreciated as part of the government's toolbox in terms of sort of more sustainable employment generation. So I think that may, you may see some attention being given to that sort of the, the classic supply side <laughs> economics, but one that's targeted towards smaller firms, micro firms, survivalist firms. I don't think that's been sufficiently appreciated um, as an armory of policymakers. I think it's going to be, there's almost a, um, I wouldn't want to say contestation, but I think it's those two kinds of big policy options that government's facing at the moment, and then you may find a blended version of that emerging, for South Africa at least. Great, thank you. I think, I mean, we're still seeing the, the pandemic in real time, and, uh, and some of the uh, policy responses definitely merit further consideration in the future to see really which ones were most effective. Uh, not only in supporting the but also, as you say, in supporting the of life and to avoid the catastrophe of, of complete closure and permanent closure of businesses. Um, unfortunately, time is our enemy today, and we'll probably close this session. Uh, let me just say thank you so much to our presenters from Burundi and South Africa. I think it's been a really excellent session. I've learned a lot. Uh, and as I've said in the chat, Feel free to get in contact with me and with the presenters if you have specific questions. I'm sure they'll be glad to respond to your questions. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the rest of the conference. So thank you very much to you all and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.